think everyone is already on the session. You may start when, when you want. Good. Uh, welcome back. <clears throat> so uh, it was uh, fun to see that uh, uh, a couple of you did uh, quite some progress. So of course you didn't finish this. Um, I didn't expect you to. The, I'm, uh, if you're interested, I'm more than happy to post the solutions to the notebooks also in the Slack channel. <clears throat> and the, uh, the last bit uh, that I wanted to do is just a, a close up. Uh, and this is, if, if you like, uh, an outlook um, for causal ideas, how causal ideas can actually play a role in a, a classical machine learning uh, tasks. Uh, and I will just scratch the surface. So I will, if that's okay for you, I will um, finish in about seven minutes. So this is five minutes past uh, 30 past. Um, okay, let me go full screen again. So the first thing is uh, just a, a very high level relation to reinforcement learning. So this is an active field of research. Um, and uh, some of you already mentioned this in a, in a question. So this is again, the kidney stone example. Um, one important uh, factorization, you have, may have seen this before, it's called the marker factorization, it looks as follows. So they're looking at the joint distribution and then they're just factorizing according to um, the conditionals R given S and T and T given S and then just S. This you can always do. But now this is a causal factorization. And the nice thing is that uh, now you can replace uh, intervening on T just means you're replacing this part of the uh, distribution. And this is really like in uh, reinforcement learning. So when you are saying that T is like your action, it's a treatment, and you have maybe some covariates, this is the, the state of the world, if you like S, and R is something like the, the reward. Uh, then what you're doing is you're changing your action. So this means you are changing, you're intervening on tree, T, uh, the treatment, and then you, you're just replacing this uh, conditional P uh, T given S. Uh, and then you can ask, well, what is the best strategy uh, that I can use uh, for finding, let's say, for finding the uh, maximal expected reward. Uh, things like this, this, is a, this already, the slide I think already shows the connection to reinforcement learning. And then if you look at off policy evaluation, it's more or less the same thing. So you can, uh, you have this uh, uh, in causality, it would be called in, uh, inverse probability weighting. Uh, it's uh, very similar techniques and the same problems appearing in both worlds. Uh, a lot of people think, including myself, that there, there could be actually uh, something to be done. Um, it's really an active field of research. I, personally, I don't think we have seen the break breakthrough in the um, making use of uh, causal knowledge and reinforcement learning, but there are already a couple of uh, examples. Uh, so feel free to search the web. But I, I could imagine that we are, uh, there will be something even coming up in the next years. Um, the, the other idea that I just wanted to mention uh, very briefly is Mm, uh, something where you uh, trade off predictability and invariance. Um, this is again something that uh, some people uh, are working on. It's, it's really an open uh, research field. I mean, if you, have, you yourself may have better ideas uh, than us, just uh, tell us. I'm more than happy to see this. Um, as I said, in classical machine learning, we are often uh, focusing on prediction and causality. You may argue that you want to fo focus on invariance. And then the big question is, of course, is it useful if you do something in between? And there's a lot of things to be in, uh, explored. Why this relates to the distributional shift that we have heard about earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, you can say that invariance causal models, they really protect yourself against arbitrary distributions on the covariances that are not the target. And you can argue that this is maybe too conservative. This is not what we would expect in, in practice. So if you're trying to find methods that perform well under distributional shifts, uh, then maybe the interventions might not be arbitrarily strong. And the idea is that maybe by, by trading off invariability and invariance and predictability, uh, you may find interesting models of that type. Um, we, we only have seen first examples there. I, I, I think um, more needs to be done. So find a trade-off between invariance with respect to an anchor uh, and predictive power. We have looked at anchor regression. Uh, just how could this look like? I mean, you can formalize this. I'm, I'm uh, not going through the details here, but for example, you just think about a regularization. So usually we regularize with lasso or rich regression where you have a norm of a parameter. You can also think about regularizing with uh, non-invariance. So if you are A for anchor, you, you can look for um, a, a term that measures predictability the mean squared error, this is the first one. And the, the second one is just the covariance between the residuals and the anchor. This is, could be a measure for non-invariance. So if this is large, this is a sign that your model is not invariant and you can uh, minimize this. These are 
convex problems and you can study a bit and the, the result that you can show is we call this anchor regression which is really a simple idea um, then you be, become optimal under um, uh, distributions that arise from uh, interventions within a certain strength and this gamma here is really the knob that you can turn in both directions and depending on the gamma you protect yourself against arbitrary uh, against interventions of that strength um, where did we apply this idea I'll skip this a bit uh, we applied this in uh, in differential equation models um, uh, in an example that I mean uh, these slides are really for if you like you click through them if you don't it's also fine but uh, here we are looking for models where you you have differential equation type models this is important in uh, uh, biology for example uh, where you don't have id data anymore but you have uh, time series and you're trying to find model dynamics uh, of variables so this is if you think about chemical reaction networks this is uh, finding chemical reaction networks and there we found actually that uh, because you have a huge model space and there this um uh this trade-off um between predictability and invariance again this could actually help to find models that are more robust with respect to um the changes in the in the distribution uh, and i really like to think about this as being a way of regularizing so this is a bit of uh, high level ideas um so these are sort of i wanted to show this slide because i, I think this are for me also exciting uh, research topics uh, and if you make progress, please tell us. So this idea of reformulating reinforcement learning, or just having another angle on it uh, to use causal structure, I think this is uh, something that I could imagine is interesting in the, in the future. Um, yeah, this uh, second idea I didn't even uh, uh, talk about. There's a relation to semi-supervised learning that is quite interesting, I think. Um, uh, and there's also this uh, this anchor regression that I talked about. These are just a couple of ideas that I wanted to just to uh, to pop up. Uh, I think it's interesting discussion. If you have another social event, uh, maybe you can talk to your fellow students about it. Uh, this is again. I just uh, wanted to show this uh, this link. It's an open access book uh, that we wrote. Uh, feel free to download it. It doesn't cost anything. Um, you can download the PDF from the MIT Press website, and we are happy to receive feedback. We already found. Quite a few typos, but uh, if you find uh, some more, please let us know. Um, with this, I, I would like to to end my lecture here. Um, it, it was a pleasure for me um, also to talk uh, to you in the breakout sessions. Um, I know that this is a lot of material. Um, I hope the slides can be maybe useful for looking at uh, them afterwards if you want to. And of course, the Jupyter notebooks, it's, uh, I don't expect that any one of you finished them. If you like, uh, just uh, have a look, go through it. In my experience, it's often very nice to just code things to, to see uh, how the concepts are, are working. Now I uh, stop talking and I leave it to the organizers whether we should uh, stop here or whether we should uh, can discuss more questions. It's up to you. Either way is fine with me. Yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, there is time for questions if people have some questions. I don't see any had... question right now in the Q&A, but... Uh, we have already can... quite a few, a few questions in, uh, during... I guess you covered already <clears throat> a lot of ground. Uh, I have a question. Okay. Jonas, first of all, thanks for the very nice uh, tutorial. Pleasure. So in, in, in some situations, for example, in, if you have a Markov chain, you can, you can change the kind of causality structure by coarse graining. If you kind of uh, take a few states and join them into one uh, meta state. Can you say something about that? Is that something that uh, you have thought about? Um, so I thought about it a bit. Uh, other people thought about this even more. Um, so indeed, the, the question of resolution becomes important uh, now, right? Because uh, of, of several issues. I mean, there are a couple of aspects. Um, so sometimes if you have, for example, uh, mm, what is a direct cause anyhow, right? So we can say uh, like smoking lung cancer or something. There are lots of um, variables in between. And my way of thinking ab about it is really to, to see um, these different models and evaluate them as interventional models. So the question is, if I write down a model, is it predicting the correct interventional distributions? So this is one way of thinking that I like, because then it means that if you are a coarse, um, if you're looking at a two coarse grained, uh, if you have a two coarse grained point of view, sometimes you're destroying the ability to predict interventional distributions. And there are a couple of uh, works who have been looking at um, 
uh, at criteria, when can I actually merge certain variables and do not lose this uh, ability to make interventional predictions? I mean, a, a postdoc, Sebastian Weichwald, uh, is an expert actually on, on this who's working at, uh, in, in Copenhagen as well. Many others have, have been doing this as well, in particular for the time series. Um, but then you, you find these ideas, right, that uh, there's this famous example of cholesterol. If there are two different types of cholesterol and some are bad and some are good, but if you're joining them to one cholesterol uh, variable, then suddenly it doesn't make any much sense anymore to talk about interventions on this because you're losing this, uh, you're losing too much in your ability to, um, to, to say what happens after an intervention. Yeah, that's an and important one, yeah. one last question, uh, one last answer maybe to this is that personally, I also felt like I, I was working quite a bit on this uh, time series um, uh, myself, and it depends on the application, whether they make sense or not, because in this biological application, for example, that we looked at, they are just this way of discrete time is just too bad of a model. So there it makes more sense to model the differential equations directly. And then uh, uh, the, the picture also changes a bit. Thank you. Good. I, I yeah. think uh, then I, I thanks uh, and I, uh, my apologies for running a bit of a time. Uh -huh. uh, all the best wishes to all the parts uh, of the world. I guess uh, it looks like people are coming from everywhere. Uh, and then have a nice uh, remaining summer school and a nice lunch. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jonas. And, uh, and goodbye. Bye-bye. Oh, thank you. We hope we can visit Lisbon sometime. <laughs> yes, I uh, would love to. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. André, juro-te.